So um, I'll start off with a little introduction, I suppose. So as I said, my name is Valerie and I'm the Chronicles editor here with Ireland Reaching Out. And what that means is that any of the user created content, so the things that you pop up online about uh, ancestors, buildings, timelines, that I um, look through them all, make sure that they're all ready to be published and then publish them each day. And I also publish some of my own, uh, which is what we're gonna get down to today. I'll be talking about a couple of interesting characters that I've come across from the Irish diaspora. And I also put out a couple of um, articles as well, usually about two a month. So you'll see one uh, following this, you know, the following days, you'll see one about Hollywood stars from Ireland and it'll follow the, the topics of this webinar as well. So everything will be repeated in that. So don't worry about, taking notes or anything. This is going to be very relaxed. We're just going to have a nice chat about Hollywood and the Irish influence on the early days of Hollywood. Uh, so I hope you're all keeping very well. I hope it's not too cold and dark where you are. Unlike here in Galway, it's getting quite chilly now these days. So the old, uh, the winds are coming in across the wild Atlantic way. So we just have to bear with that. But I suppose it'll, it'll keep us on brand anyways. <laughs> So I uh, suppose, first of all, I should explain to, for those of you that aren't aware a little bit about Ireland reaching out. And I suppose the best way for me to do that is to show you the website. So I'm gonna start off now by sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, so now you should be able to see my screen. And here I am on the Ireland reaching out homepage. Now I'm already logged in here. And you can see as you scroll down, it gives you options to have a look at the ancestors, buildings and timelines. Timelines are events that are on our system. Scroll down further and you see how you can get really interactive as well. So we've got the message board just over here. That's where you can post any query that you might have about your civil parish of origin, about your family history research, anything at all. Feel free to pop it up there and our wonderful team of volunteers will be able to help you out. And we also have our community, so that can help you figure out exactly what parish you might belong to, because it can be a little bit difficult sometimes. The names can get a little confusing. But again, that's where our volunteers are there to help you out with that, to help welcome you to your parish. We've also got some great news items down here, so feel free to have a look through those. And we've got some genealogy tips and connection stories and meet and greet because that's one of the most wonderful things I think about Ireland reaching out is in you know, non-pandemic times when we are allowed to travel around the world. We love when you come from other countries to Ireland and meet with our volunteers and get to actually walk the land that your ancestors would have worked and um, really immerse yourself in the communities that they came from. So that's really the ultimate goal. So if you are planning a visit to Ireland when restrictions are lifted eventually, do let us know, we'd love to hear about it and help you out any way that we can. So what we're gonna talk about today is a couple of really interesting characters from the early days of Hollywood. So I think uh, we can all agree that in the recent, well, it's not even recent months now, like in most of this year, we've all come to rely a little more heavily than usual on the comfort of films and TV to get us through the long, long hours of the day, uh, particularly now that the evenings are getting a lot shorter, at least they are here in Ireland. It's dark pretty early in the day now. And so it's a good time for us to look at how Ireland has contributed to filmmaking. And we're going to completely gloss over the terrible Irish accents in the trailer for the new movie, Wild Mountain Time, because uh, there are plenty of wonderfully talented Irish actors that could have probably done a better job of the accent, but we won't go down that rabbit hole. So obviously in the early days of Hollywood, the Irish movie scene, though it's pretty thriving now, was a bit slower to get off the ground than the case in Britain and in America. So for that reason, anyone in Ireland who had the means and had been bitten by the acting bug, they had to travel to Hollywood in order to really make a name for themselves. And just so we're very clear going forwards, that's Hollywood, California, not Hollywood Wicklow. There is a sign, it's a little bit dilapidated. There's a lot more sheep and a lot less people, but we do have a Hollywood. 
So we're going to start off with our first character. And this is a really interesting one. This one really caught my eye. I came across him a few months back. And there's a load of documentaries on YouTube about him because he had a pretty interesting life and an even more interesting death. But we'll get to that. So this is William Desmond Taylor, not the most well known of the Irish Hollywood stars. So he was born William Cunningham Dean Tanner in County Carlow, a member of the Irish gentry and grew up in Evington House. So really a wealthy family. But as a young man, like so many others at the time, he emigrated to the United States. And that's where he really rekindled his love of acting that he discovered as a young man. Now, when he first went to the States, he moved to Kansas, where he worked on a dude ranch, but he eventually made his way to New York City. That's where he met his wife. She was also an actor. Her name was Ethel May Hamilton, and the two got married in 1901. They also had a daughter less than two years after their marriage, but the relationship was really rocky. I mean, you put two big egos together, two actors, chances are there's going to be a lot of arguing. I mean, just ask Elizabeth Taylor. So the marriage doesn't go too well. And one day William disappears. He literally vanished into thin air. He was missing presumed dead. Even friends of his, they said to his wife that he'd seemed really out of sorts lately. And for a couple of weeks, he'd seemed really disoriented and wasn't really sure, if, like they weren't sure if he was in the right frame of mind. So because he'd been missing for so long, it was presumed that he had just wandered off after a bout of amnesia. And since he was missing presumed dead, after about four years, his wife was able to obtain a state divorce. So this divorce comes through in 1912. Now that's the same year that he arrives in Hollywood. And what he got up to in Hollywood, well, that's where it gets really interesting. So he arrives in San Francisco and the last four years of his life are completely unaccounted for. He made a lot of claims that he had been working in um, mining uh, towns in Alaska and Canada, but none of this was ever proven. It was always really quite sketchy. He started getting into the movies, picking up a little bit of acting work here and there. But it was really as a director that he grew a really big following. He ended up directing about 50 movies in total and was one of the founding members of a company that would become Paramount. So hugely, hugely influential person in Hollywood. He <laughs> Then he finally gets found out by his ex-wife, who still to this day thinks that he's missing. Because when he arrived in Hollywood, that's when he changed his name to William Desmond Taylor. So he's there under an assumed name. But his ex-wife goes to the movies one day with her daughter, sees this man on the screen and has this moment of, that's your dad. <laughs> so she decides that she's going to call him up on it. So she tracks him down, makes her way to Hollywood, finds out where he's living and confronts him. And he basically tells her, look, this is my new life now. I'm not going back. You can't make me. And she obviously wants nothing to do with him because he's abandoned her once already. And she says, I don't want anything to do with you, but this is your daughter. You know, you need to recognize that this is your child. And he does. He does the right thing by his daughter and he names her his legal heir. So that this fortune that he's amassed for himself in Hollywood, as soon as he dies, will go to his daughter, his only child. Now, less than a year later, William Desmond Taylor is found dead in his home. He lived in an apartment in a really glitzy area in Hollywood. So all of his neighbors were all of the glitterati, all of the huge stars of the time, directors, writers, actors, anyone, you name it. They were all living in the same area in kind of like almost like a complex of apartments. There were gunshots heard, but people just kind of bobbed it off, thought of nothing of it. When he was discovered in the morning by his valet, obviously he called for help. But it being Hollywood, everyone had to have a look at what the latest gossip was. So huge numbers of people poured into the room, basically destroying any forensic evidence that could have been used to determine what had happened. And this one man comes out of the crowd and declares, well, I'm a doctor. Let me have a look at him. 
And he comes in, he takes one look at the body and he goes, ah, yes, this man clearly died of a stomach hemorrhage. And everyone says, OK, doctor, doctor wouldn't lie to us. And the doctor leaves and is never found again. When the forensics team arrived to clear the scene, they lift his body and it's pretty obvious that the man has been shot in the back. So not exactly a stomach hemorrhage. The bullet even falls out of his back like it was blatantly that he'd been shot. So all of a sudden, this has gone from being a medical tragic death to a murder investigation. They have never found who killed William Desmond Taylor. No one has ever been convicted of the crime. It's gone completely unpunished. And to this day, it remains one of the greatest mysteries of early Hollywood. There were a lot of different people who were suspected first. There was a studio head that he'd had a lot of issues with. Um, who actually had been in there tampering with evidence and planting evidence. There was a man who had been blackmailing Taylor using his uh, his original name and had been stealing from him and uh, pawning different things that he'd stolen from him. And then there was another girl who was um, suspected, a girl that he'd been involved with. Her mother was also suspected. But I think it's pretty clear, and maybe it's just the cynic in me, but I think it's pretty clear it was the wife. I mean, <laughs> she gets all of his money signed over to her daughter, and within a year, he's dead. So I think that's a pretty clear-cut case from my perspective. So I suppose the um, the moral of the story is don't ghost people, because it won't end well. <laughs> so that's William Desmond Taylor. And as I said, there's tons of like unsolved mysteries and... Um, murder mystery documentaries about him on YouTube. Really, really interesting the way it all played out. Uh, but yeah, not a, not a great end for William Desmond Taylor. So we're going to move on to another actor, Errol Leslie Flynn, the dashing swashbuckling captain of the high seas. So Errol Leslie Flynn, he wasn't born in Ireland. He was born in Tasmania in 1909 but he was of Irish descent. So his grandparents on his father's side, they came from Leitrim and Meath. So that's where his Irish connection comes in. When he was a young man, he had a lot of trouble in school. He hopped around schools a lot. He moved to London for two years and tried to pursue an education there. Didn't go too well. And he ended up coming back to Australia, but he just was repeatedly getting expelled from school after school and being um, suspended. He was constantly in trouble, just a real troublemaker, which was something that would uh, continue to be a theme in his adult life. <laughs> he used to take on a few jobs. He'd do little bits of jobs here and there. He traveled to New Guinea for a while. And then he all of a sudden had this hugely dramatic turn in his life. So he was cast in a movie in 1933 called In the Wake of the Bounty. He was cast as the lead in this. And although the film wasn't really much of a box office hit, it really gave him this desire to be an actor and this thirst for fame. He left Australia again, uh, going to Britain, and that's where he was decided. He decided finally that he was going to pursue his career as an actor. He had a little bit of success in Britain. Uh, he was cast in a couple of theatre productions, a little bit of film work. But he didn't really achieve superstardom until he moved to Hollywood. So when he arrives in Hollywood, he's very quickly snapped up by Warner Brothers because he is handsome. He is charming. He has this debonair attitude about him and he just makes the perfect leading man, especially for a certain type of movie, pirate movies. So he becomes this swashbuckling character and he gets very much typecast in that role. And his most famous role was as Robin Hood in the 1938 movie. That was the role that really made him an absolute superstar. In 1959, he released an autobiography and it was ghostwritten and called My Wicked, Wicked Ways. Now, in this book, he describes his personal life as being this wildly over the top life that he you know he's a renowned womanizer not a great guy um <laughs> but yeah he made these extreme claims about his life that he had actually lived as a pirate on the high seas when he was in new guinea um, 
really outlandish claims and I'm sure most of it was just poetic license but it makes for an interesting read nonetheless. <laughs> Um, he didn't have a great sense of taking care of himself, so his life was pretty hedonistic, and that also meant that you know he was a heavy drinker and he was a very heavy smoker and deeply, deeply unhealthy. And he tried to enlist in the U.S. Army, but he failed the medical exam based purely on his health being so poor. He died in, 18, uh, in 1959, um, but he left behind him an absolute legacy of Hollywood hits and, of course, personal scandals. So I have a clip here of him as Robin Hood. So I'm going to hit play on this and we'll watch a minute or two. <laughs> So that's Errol Flynn, and uh, I suppose that gives you an idea of the type of character that he played. And it's also very much the type of character that he was in real life, this brazen scoundrel, um, not afraid to throw his weight around, though I'm sure he wore slightly less sparkly tunics in real life, I would imagine. So that's Errol Flynn. And now we come to the final actor that we're going to talk about. And uh, this one really do save the best for last because it's absolutely impossible to have any sort of a conversation about the Irish influence on Hollywood without mentioning Hollywood's Irish sweetheart, Maureen O'Hara. So Maureen was born Maureen Fitzsimmons in 1920 in Beechwood Avenue in Ranala in Dublin. As a young child, now it's hard to imagine this because she was such a beautiful woman, but she was a, really a tomboy as a child. She was really sporty. She loved playing camogie and she fished in the Dodder River. But um, she really found her love for acting when she was about 10 years old. So at that age, she enlisted, well, joined a, a theatre company in Rathmines. And she started her training there. So she would do pantomimes and musicals in the area. Four years later, she joined Ireland's National Theatre, the Abbey. And after this, she left Ireland to complete her acting training in London, where she attended the illustrious school, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, which is still to this day, it's one of the top three most highly regarded drama schools in London, along with Lambda and Rada. And it was in London that Maureen began to make films. So that was where she really, really found her niche. She made a few smaller appearances, building up a CV for herself, but her first starring role in a movie 
was in an adaptation of Daphne du Maurier's novel, Jamaica Inn. This was in 1939 and it was directed by Alfred Hitchcock, no less. So this role won her huge amounts of recognition and that is what got her her entrance to Hollywood. There she was cast in The Hunchback of Notre Dame and the rest, as they say, is history. Her star just continued to rise and it got to dizzying heights with her most notable role, of course, being the one that we all remember her for, Mary Kate Danaher in the 1952 movie, The Quiet Man, which was filmed in Cannes. So in, she also, like not even looking at her, her acting, but her what her presence meant in Hollywood. So she was called the Queen of Technicolor because she was one of the first stars of color movies. And she had this hugely extensive filmography. It's packed full of these iconic roles in some of the favorite movies of all time. They're all films that like we would watch at Christmas time and you know, any family get together. It's certainly The Quiet Man is on TV here in Ireland every Christmas and usually Easter as well. It's that and Ryan's daughter. They're the two that you always see. And in 2014, her contribution to filmmaking was finally recognized when she was awarded an honorary Oscar by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Maureen O'Hara, we sadly lost her five years ago. Um, she would have been, she would have turned 100 this year, uh, just la uh, in August, just gone. But she passed away at the age of 95 in 2015 in Idaho in the USA. And it's worth noting that when she was uh, applying to the judge for her American naturalization and citizenship, she <laughs> was asked to renounce any um, any fealty to the British crown. And she stood before them and said, I can't renounce anything I've never made, I'm Irish. And she was the first person to be legally recognized as Irish American. So there's another thing that we have Maureen O'Hara to thank for. And just because we can't not have a look at it, here's a lovely scene from The Quiet Man. old one you are. And who gave you leave to be kissing me? So you can talk. Yes, I can. I will and I do. More than talk you'll be getting if you step a step closer to me. Don't worry. You got a wallop. You'll get over it, I'm thinking. Well, some things a man doesn't get over so easy. Like what, supposing? Like the sight of a girl coming through the fields with the sun on her hair, kneeling in church with a face like a saint. Satan. <laughs> Come into a man's house to clean it for him? But that was just by way of being a good Christian act. I know it was, Mary Kate Danaher. It was nice of you. Not at all.
Yeah, so there's Maureen. Uh, there's some great folklore around that film as well. So they say that in that scene when she slaps him, that she actually broke her hand. There's a number of the crew that have attested to that. And she did not miss a beat. She just kept going. So a consummate professional. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to come back to you. Um, obviously, the three individuals discussed here are just a drop in the ocean of the Irish contribution to Hollywood. Uh, there's also uh, Rex Ingram was from Ireland, a huge number of other actors and even not even that they're from Ireland, but some that had really strong Irish connections. So Walt Disney, Judy Garland, like the list goes on and on and on. And uh, if any of you have done any research on any of these individuals and um, you'd like to add them to the Chronicles, I'd love that. If you need any help with doing that, feel free to email me. You'll get me on vkelly at irelandxo.com or you can just reply to the, the link that was sent to you for this meeting. That'll get you to me as well. So yeah, that is um, all I have on those. Uh, so there were countless men and women that passed through the, the streets of LA as actors, writers, directors. So the next time you're watching a classic movie, keep an eye out as the credits roll for those telltale Irish names. They're definitely there to be found. <laughs> So yeah, that's all I have for you this evening. Uh, Laura, were there any questions at all? Um, thank you so much, Valerie. That was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. I loved watching that scene from The Quiet Man. I'm going to have to get the full get the full experience now. Um, did somebody asked, where was The Quiet Man filmed? I'm going to say Kong, but I think Kong. you might know better. Yeah. Yeah, it was filmed in Kong. Yeah. Uh, a lot of stuff seems to get filmed in Kong now, I suppose, with Ashford being there. There's actually, a, there's a TV show on Netflix now called Rain, and uh, it's all about Mary Queen of Scots and set in France mostly, but uh, it's all filmed in Kong. <laughs> and I know that you used to be able to go and see a reconstruction of the, the house where Mary lived in, was it Mam Cross? Okay. Yeah, that's out near Mam Cross. So mm -hmm. I see, saw somebody was asking Con. I never really Con is in Mayo. It's, it's like on the Mayo Galway border. So I think some people try to claim part of it as Galway, but it's it's Mayo. And uh, yeah, and there were some filming locations then that were in the Galway side of it. So real Joyce country, that sort of area is. Yeah, and and, and as picturesque as the film portrays. Yeah. Absolutely. It's beautiful out there. Kong is my, my favourite village in the entire country. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, somebody is asking, what is the current film you mentioned at the beginning that had an actor with a bad Irish accent? <laughs> you can multiply it, that. It's worth looking up. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a new movie coming out called Wild Mountain Time, and that's time as in the the herb, not the clock. And it's a, it's a romance and Emily Blunt and... Um, Jamie Dornan. Jamie Jamie Dornan has a terrible Irish accent in it, which is shocking because he's Irish. And uh, oh, what's his name? Um, the older man that's in it, Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken is in it with the like. He just sounds like Christopher Walken. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's quite a. It's kind of done like The Quiet Man, but it's set in the modern day. So like Emily Blunt's character has dirt on her face in every scene. So I'm I don't so think we're lovely. quite that primitive anymore. <laughs> We haven't actually seen it though. Everybody here is talking about the the the, the trailer, but nobody's actually seen the film yet. So yeah, I'm very excited to see it and uh, critique it heavily. <laughs> <laughs> but there are um, no other questions relating to to actors or your um, your presentation, Valerie. Grand. Um, well, yeah. Like I said, if anyone has any questions about. Um, uh, adding ancestors or anything like that or using the chronicles or if you just uh, want to get in touch about the the program and about the website feel free to email us that's what we're there for and yeah if that's all then I guess we'll log off and say good night for the someone, evening someone is saying you forgot Grace Kelly of course I was almost named after Grace Kelly but my mother wouldn't allow it <laughs> And Maureen O'Sullivan from Roscommon. But these are wonderful mm -hmm. names that we would love to see on the Chronicles if you have the time to put them up. Yeah, absolutely. Like if anyone feels like putting up, like literally all you need to get started is like if you can put a photo, a date of birth, a date of death and uh, their civil parish of origin and we can kind of other people can build on it from there. And as I say, shoot me an email and I'll talk you through how to how to do that. 
Uh, like obviously I had to just keep it to three for this evening or like we'd be here all night if we tried to talk about all of them. But yeah, there's some really, really fantastic names there. But just to keep in mind, if you are adding anyone to the Chronicles, make sure they were born at least 100 years ago. So that's why Maureen O'Hara could only go up this year because she, she just hit the 100 mark. Uh, uh, yeah, so if you all take care and as I say, shoot me an email. Don't be a stranger. Uh, that's what I'm here for. Uh, lovely to talk to you all this evening and to see all your smiling faces. Uh, yeah, look after yourselves and each other and we'll talk again soon. Bye. Bye.